<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Happy Monday. It's going to be a great week. I have, <laughs> I have very long things, long, long toppers at the top. Just warning you all, no falling asleep, please. Okay, uh, so we've gotten more strong economic news in recent days. On Friday, our economy created more than 200,000 jobs last month under President Biden's leadership. We have now created a total of 15.7 million jobs over the last three and a half years. Yesterday, a record 3 million travelers were screened at airports, a sign that our economy is strong and Americans are back on the road for the summer in record numbers. Speaking of which, last week we sold 1 million barrels of gasoline to help lower gas prices ahead of the 4th of July, which saw the lowest gas prices in three years. And today, a new report from the Economic Innovation Group highlighted what the New York Times called a, quote, a remarkable comeback under President Biden. That report found that communities that have been lifted behind struggled under the last, last administration, what the Times called a particularly grim stretch under Donald Trump. But those communities are coming back under President Biden with jobs growing more than four times faster than in the previous four years. Investments spurred by the president's investing in America agenda are benefiting previously left behind communities. That's just some of the economic progress happening under President Biden. Watch out for more news in the coming days. Exciting. And next, I want to share highlights from the president's recent schedule, as well as looking ahead to the next two weeks. So over the last 10 days, President Biden has been hitting the road and meeting directly with the American people, as well as continuing his job as leader of the country. In the two days after the debate, he met with supporters in Atlanta, Raleigh, New York, and New Jersey. Last week, he delivered remarks on the Supreme Court, visited the DC Emergency Operations Center for a briefing on extreme weather events, hosted a Medal of Honor ceremony, and joined the First Lady for a 4th of July barbecue with active duty military service members and their families throughout the week. The president also spoke with leaders of the UK, United Kingdom, Israel, and the Republic of South Africa. On Friday, the president traveled to Madison, Wisconsin for a campaign rally. On Sunday, just yesterday, he held numerous events across Pennsylvania with elected officials, including Governor Shapiro, Senator Fetterman, and Congresswoman Madeline Dean. He participated in interviews, including joining Morning Joe just this morning. And throughout, the president has engaged with elected leaders, including members of Congress, governors, and local officials. This week, President Biden will speak to national labor leaders of AFL-CIO, host the NATO summit to show the unprecedented strength of our alliance, hold a press conference, a big boy press conference, according to Justin Sink from Bloomberg, <laughs> who's not here, but Josh, you are here, I see you. <laughs> so that will happen on Thursday and travel to Michigan on Friday for a campaign event. And next week, he will travel to Texas and Las Vegas. On July 15th, he will commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act at the LBJ <coughs> Presidential Library in Austin, Texas. He will highlight the Biden-Harris administration's progress advancing civil rights and his vision to bring America together. On July 16th, he will address the 115th NAACP National Convention in Las Vegas, emphasizing the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to advancing racial justice and e equity for all Americans, including black Americans. On July 17th, he will speak to the UNODOS, UN, UNODOS annual conference where he will underline the Biden-Harris administration's historic accomplishments, including lowering prescription drug costs for America's seniors, lowering the Latino uninsured rate, and creating a Latino small business boom. And finally, I just mentioned the U.S. is going to be hosting the 75th uh, summit, the NATO summit right here in the United States, obviously in Washington, D.C. this week. NATO is the most powerful and capable alliance 
in the world and President Biden is proud, very proud to have worked to strengthen it and also expand it. So with that, the Admiral from the National Security Council is here uh, to take your questions on that. I do have a few things to get through, so I ask you to bear with me. As uh, Crane mentioned, the President's looking forward to hosting the leaders from 38 different countries this week in Washington for a historic summit to mark the 75th anniversary of the NATO summit. Now, this will obviously include the leaders of all our NATO allies, as well as NATO partners, including Ukraine, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea. Before we discuss the schedule, uh, I just want to take a minute to discuss the context in which NATO leaders will be gathering this week. For 75 years, NATO has served a vital role in protecting the American people and in making the world a less dangerous place. NATO is the strongest defensive alliance in history, and today it is bigger, stronger, better resourced, and more united than ever before, in large part due to President Biden's leadership over the past three years. He's worked hard to expand the alliance by welcoming two new members, Sweden and Finland, and will officially welcome in Sweden uh, this week. Uh, he has spent countless hours rallying the alliance in 2021 and 2022 to build a global coalition to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and to provide indispensable support to that country. And I'll get that more on that in just a second. The president has also strongly encouraged greater partnerships between the NATO alliance and friendly nations around the world, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, as you will see. And the president knows that the global threats and challenges that we all face, including from authoritarian actors and terrorist organizations, are inextricably linked. He has also encouraged our NATO allies to join him in making significant investments in our mutual defense and deterrence capabilities. Now, when the Biden-Harris Biden administration took office, only nine NATO allies were spending at least 2% of their gross domestic product on defense. 2% was the Wales Pledge. That was the goal that every member of the alliance had had uh, swore that they would get to. Today, a record 23 NATO allies are at or above the minimum level of 2% of GDP on defense spending, more than twice as many as in 2020 and nearly eight times higher than when the allies first set that 2% benchmark a decade ago. Now, just quickly turning to the schedule, tomorrow evening, President Biden will welcome NATO leaders, and he and Dr. Biden will host a 75th anniversary commemoration event at the Mellon Auditorium. That is the site I think you all know when the NATO treaty was formally signed in 1949. On Wednesday, the President will hold his first bilateral meeting with the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Keir Starmer, here at the White House. The President will also meet with the 32 members of the alliance at the Convention Center. And then later that evening, he and Dr. Biden will host NATO leaders for a dinner again here at the White House. On Thursday morning, NATO will hold a meeting with the EU and with NATO's Indo-Pacific partners, that's Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and New Zealand, to deepen our cooperation. And then on Thursday afternoon, there'll be a meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Council, after which the President will host an event with President Zelensky and nearly two dozen of our allies and partners who have signed bilateral security agreements with Ukraine, just as the President did, as you saw in Italy a week or so ago. After that, the President will hold a press conference. I I guess a big boy press conference yes. is what we're calling it, um, and take some questions from you all. Uh, now, uh, we're working to also set up some additional meetings, uh, bilateral meetings. Uh, the, right, the only two that I can speak to right now are with the UK Prime Minister and President Zelensky, but I have no doubt there'll be ad additional bilats, uh, and as we get more fidelity on those, we'll let you know. Uh, finally, as customary for uh, as customary for summits the United States hosts, there'll be a leaders, spouses, and partners program hosted by Dr. Biden. Now, if I could just quickly turn to Ukraine, because back to the context for what this meeting is all about, I think it's important to just do a quick update here about what the situation is on the ground. Since the passage of the supplemental in April, the president has authorized seven security packages to help Ukraine, including five drawdowns of munitions and equipment. The resumption of that U.S. aid has made a significant impact on the battlefield. Instead of the nightmare scenarios that were predicted several months ago about what we could see heading into the NATO summit, we've seen the situation stabilize. Ukrainian forces have successfully stopped Russia's attack north of Kharkiv, denying Russia the ability to take that city and limiting Russian gains to areas just across the border. The Ukrainians have held the line in Chaziv Yar. They've held fast east of Pokrovsk hardening their defenses and ensuring that Russia will not break through. And they've halted Russian attacks in Zaporizhia. Throughout these last three months, the Russians have attacked relentlessly across all those fronts. And the price that they have paid for the few meters that they have gained here and there has been extensive. Heavy casualties, destroyed equipment, disrupted supply lines, 
degraded morale. The people of Ukraine have yet again demonstrated that when supplied and when supported by the international community in the United States, they can hold off the largest, though certainly not, I think is clearly evident, the most capable army in Europe. Their success is not just limited to the front. Ukraine has put U.S. provided ATACMs, the long range strike missiles, to good use in Crimea, destroying Russian surface to air missile systems, commandos, airfields. They sunk the last cruise missile capable warship in the port of Sevastopol, and the Russian Black Sea, now, Black sea Fleet has now fled Crimea in response. While it has been heartening to see Ukraine hold on in this critical period, we should not forget the grim reality. Russia continues to bombard frontline towns with massive and low accuracy glide bombs and sending missiles at Ukrainian cities, including over just the past weekend, where they hit a hospital, a children's hospital. Russia has ramped up its campaign against Ukrainian electrical generation, depriving the civilian population of power and attempting to set the conditions to punish them over the fall and the winter. To strengthen Ukraine's air defenses and to help Ukraine protect its cities and its grid, the United States and several of our allies will have several big announcements at this week's summit. And the NATO Alliance will announce significant new steps to strengthen its military and political partnership with Ukraine to help Ukraine continue to defend themselves today and to deter Russian aggression well into the future. These elements, taken together with bilateral support, are part of a bridge to Ukraine's NATO membership. Together, the Washington summit will send a strong signal to Mr. Putin that if he thinks he can outlast the coalition of countries that are supporting Ukraine, he's dead wrong again. As President Biden has said himself, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia, for free people refuse to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, John. Um, you mentioned the context of the summit uh, this week. Uh, it's also the first time the president interacted with these world leaders um, since that uh, the disastrous debate against former President Trump uh, 10 days or so ago, uh, where the president strongly confront uh, the former president on all sorts of things. Um, what is the president's, uh, you know, does the president feel the, uh, how does he plan to uh, reassure American allies in NATO that he is up for the job now when he couldn't confront Trump on stage then? I think the question presupposes the notion that they need to be reassured of American leadership and President Biden's commitment, and I don't believe that's the case. Uh, we're not picking up any signs of that from our allies at all, quite the contrary. The conversations that we're having with them in advance, they're, they're excited about this summit, they're excited about the possibilities and the things that we're going to be doing together specifically to help Ukraine. So you've seen zero, I mean, there have been stories in multiple outlets from both sides of the Atlantic over the last several days uh, with questions from European leaders about the president's capacity to lead, to lead the United States. Are you just denying that? I'm not aware of any such conversations that uh, uh, have been had, certainly none with us and, and, uh, and here at the White House and with our staff. We're looking forward to it. Uh, I want to you know, go back to what I said at the beginning. In the last three years, rather than browbeating and insulting and demeaning allies, this president has invested in allies and partnerships. And when he took office, what I said, nine, only nine uh, allies had reached the 2% level. Now 23. That's not by accident. That's because of leadership. That's because of constant stewardship of the alliance uh, and other partnerships around the world. Uh, the president's record speaks for itself, and the allies and the non-NATO uh, friends and partners that are coming as well, they know that. They wouldn't be coming. New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, to a NATO summit if they didn't believe in American leadership and how important it is, and if they didn't believe that President Biden takes that responsibility extremely seriously. Uh, Admiral, good to see you. Uh, on the point about European country, NATO members boosting their defense spending, that was something, though, that was a big concern of the last president. It's part of the reason many of them are boosting their funding. And it was a concern of the president before the last president. As you recall, President Obama said the same thing. This, this pledge goes back a decade or so. Um, but the numbers speak for themselves, Ed. And rather than browbeating and yelling and screaming and complaining and whining about it, President Biden invested in this alliance. And he, just the last three and a half years now, more than double the number of allies have reached that 2%. Two questions on the follow from the debate. Have you, in your meetings with him, ever seen him appear similarly to the way he did on debate night? Look, I'm a spokesman. And, and you're the last, in a lot of meetings with him. I am. The last thing I'm going to do is sit here and, and talk about every meeting I've had with the president. What I can tell you is what I saw in that debate is not reflective of the man and the leader and the commander in chief that I have spent many, many hours with over the last two and a half years in terms of the, um, the specificity of the way he probes, the questions he asks. Hey, just this morning, 
uh, uh, he was asking me questions about the situation on the European continent that I couldn't answer, and I told him I had to get back to him. On another, when he met with governors last week, he suggested he'd like to curtail events that begin after 8 p.m. at night uh, just because he'd rather focus on resting and doesn't want to have a long day. In your understanding of things, has the National Security Council ever withheld information from him he should have known late at night out of concern he might not be able to process it? No. Um, Russia has bombed Ukraine's largest children's hospital, as you noted. Do you believe the timing of these strikes is meant to send a message to NATO ahead of this week's summit? It's hard to draw a line, Mary, to that. I mean, sadly, th this is par for the course for Mr. Putin to hit civilian infrastructure, and he doesn't care whether he's hitting hospitals or residential buildings. Um, I, I can't draw the line that, that this is some sort of message. But look, I mean, uh, as I said, what you're going to see over the course of the week is a very set of, of strong signals and messages to Mr. Putin that he can't wait NATO out, can't wait the United States out, that we're going to continue to support Ukraine. Good um, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask about the air defenses and some of the sort of deliverables that are coming out of the NATO summit. Can you walk us through what you think will be happening in terms of um, any additional commitments in, in addition to the, the funding packages? have come. Um, and can you say a few words about this um, <clears throat> project to sort of um, consolidate the way that weapons are going to Ukraine through the uh, distribution center that I think there's a, a, a center that will be set up in Wiesbaden under coordination. coordination center. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't, uh, the purpose for me to come today was just kind of give you the lay down of, the, uh, of the, the summit ahead and not to get too far ahead of the leaders and the specific deliverables. But um, so without doing that and without getting fired, I'll just tell you that uh, uh, you're going to see some uh, announcements on air defense. You're going to see uh, some announcements on deterrence capabilities, uh, not just with respect to helping Ukraine but, but boosting the alliance. You're going to see some uh, announcements with respect to uh, uh, the defense industrial base and how to shore up that and make it more resilient and invest it more, including in our own industrial base here in the United States. Uh, and you're going to see, as I alluded to, uh, some discussion about um, Ukraine's path to NATO and what, that, and what that can look like, and a reaffirmation of what the President has long said, that, that, that NATO is in Ukraine's future. Just to follow up on that, can you say whether the word irreversible will be in the communique? I'm not going to get ahead of the specific language one and way or the other. And then just on Israel and Gaza, can you say anything about the Israeli response to the Hamas response to the ceasefire proposal? Lots of responses. Yeah. So no surprise to you all, I'm not going to negotiate here from the podium in Republic. Um, I would just tell you that um, there has been some back and forth. As you know, we have a team in Cairo right now that includes Brett McGurk and the director of the CIA. Um, they're meeting with their Egyptian, uh, Israeli, uh, and uh, Jordanian counterparts, and there'll be follow-on discussions after that uh, over the next few days. Um, look, we've been working this very, very hard, and there are still some gaps that remain in the two sides and the positions. But we wouldn't have sent a team over there if we didn't think that we had a shot here. And we're going to take every shot we can uh, to see if we can't get this ceasefire deal in place. Within days? I, I, I couldn't give you a date certain. Good. David? Thank you. Um, John, thanks for doing this. Um, first, just to follow up on the communique, even if you can't get into it, irreversible. The President's objection last year and Chancellor Schultz's objection, if I remember Vilnius correctly, was that neither one of them wanted a date set for fear, I assume, that the United States and its allies would be drawn into the ground war if, if Ukraine was still at war while a NATO member. Does that remain today to be his primary object, objection? Is he willing to do wording that just is short of a date? Because even if you do the word irreversible or not, it doesn't really change the meaning very much of what you published in Vilnius. And I have a second on just a level of... Look, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make this simple but unsatisfying. I, again, I'm not going to get into the text and the discussions about what the draft's going to look like, David. I think you can understand that. But I do think your question is important to um, 
to provide some context to you, the, the president still believes that NATO is in Ukraine's future. Um, what that future looks like depends on an awful lot of factors. Right now, you got a war going on inside Ukraine, and the focus rightly has got to be on helping them win that war. Uh, and we are, as I detailed in my opening statement. Uh, number two, for any country that wants to join NATO, any country, and it's, and it's, a, uh, it's an alliance of democracies, the democracies have to meet certain, uh, certain guidelines, uh, particularly when it comes to governance. And we are and will continue to work with Ukraine on reforms that are necessary for any democracy that wants to be a member uh, of NATO. And then the third thing I'd say is, you know, it's a, it's a unanimous vote. Everybody has to be on board with that, and that can take some time as well. So the focus is on making sure that they can win now uh, and that we can continue to work with Ukraine so that there is a path to NATO. The last thing I'd say is uh, back to the bilateral security agreement that the president uh, signed with President Zelensky at the G7 in Italy. I mean, we're one of many other nations that have done that too because we know that whenever this war ends, however it ends, and whatever the border looks like, Ukraine's still going to have a long border with Russia uh, that's going to need to be defended. And they're going to need the reassurance uh, of being able to put forth a capable and competent defensive ca capability against Russian forces going forward. And that's why we're making sure that there are things in, in line to make sure that Ukraine can defend itself. I want to follow up on that. You mentioned that it was 10 years ago that the 2 percent GDP goal was set. Obviously, there was no war underway at that time. And so the entire security situation looks radically different than it does, uh, than it did when that, that was set. Well, I, I beg to differ. There was there was fighting in Afghanistan, was, and, and Mr. Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014. In 2014, yeah. Um, but I think the 2% may have been set. It was in Wales. It might have been set before the invasion. But nevertheless, it was still a tense security environment. Right. We're in something much, much different today. I think we're, we're, we're all in agreement, just given the amount of arms. No argument. Worth going in. So is part of the president's message um, at this summit that 2% is in the rearview mirror, that the NATO allies are going to have to be spending significantly more than that, maybe double that, uh, for some countries, some larger economies. Uh, or is he going to stay away from numbers? I know it's politically sensitive with all of them. You also you mentioned the word win. I was wondering how you're defining that. Okay, there's a lot there. Uh, the president's not going to set a new bar or a new uh, level of GDP spending on defense here at this summit. The goal is 2 percent. It was a commitment everybody made 10 years ago. Not everybody's there. Most of the remaining nations that haven't reached 2 percent, most of them, not all, uh, are working on it and are getting there. Uh, and so I think the president wants to, you know, to focus on that, uh, uh, wants to laud and commemorate those who have, but also make it clear that those who haven't still have some, they still have some work to do. On when, I, I think we've been consistent about this. I mean, uh, at least I think I have. I mean, we. We want all of Ukraine's sovereign territory respected, which means we want no Russian forces in any part of Ukraine by the internationally recognized boundaries. Um, John, you just said, um, answering a question to uh, Zeke, you're not picking up on signs of allies needing reassurances when it comes to President Biden. But the allies also look for a secure United States. Have you heard any conversations from the allies about issues of the elections process here, what they've been seeing, and the stability of the United States in the next few months, couple of years, et cetera? I'm not aware of any specific conversations with respect to our domestic political situation. But look, April, uh, uh, we watch the domestic political situation of our allies and partners. Uh, of course, like we did with the UK and with France over the weekend, and, and we have no doubt that they're watching ours as well, and that they'll be watching our election uh, with, uh, you know, w with a lot of keen interest. We we certainly would expect that, but I'm not aware of any conversations that we've had at senior levels here, um, at the NSC or elsewhere here at the White House, uh, uh, from allies specifically about this this particular election. Of the European uh, Union, who who gathered reporters a couple of years ago with concerns about democracy here? They, they might be talking to y'all, but I'm not aware of any specific conversations here.
just want to circle back, uh, Admiral, on Ed's question. So you said uh, broadly that the president, in your view, is not represented by what was on the debate stage. Then you gave us an anecdote about a meeting today where he was engaged and so forth. Are you saying you have never encountered a situation where you thought that he was displaying any of those symptoms or uh, affectations or a, you know, something that would give pause, or are you just declining to answer one way or another? Well, I'm a little uncomfortable a a answering these kinds of questions because as a spokesman, my job is to be an advisor and counselor, and I don't think it's appropriate for a spokesman to... Uh, yeah, so I did because I wanted to make it clear. So, for, yes, I'm uncomfortable with these kinds of questions, but to answer, your, to answer your specific question, in my experience the last two and a half years, I have not seen any reason whatsoever um, to question or doubt um, his lucidity, his grasp of context, his probing nature, um, and the degree to which he is completely uh, in, in charge of facts and figures. And if he isn't, what I've seen is, because it happened to me this morning, when, when he isn't and when I can't be in command of those facts and figures, I, I, I have to fess up and go get the information that he's asking for. And he asked me some questions this morning I didn't have answers for. Okay, Claudia. Thank you, Karine. Uh, two questions on the Middle East. Israel has conducted the largest seizure of land in the West Bank, which undermines the president's vision for two-state solution. So why the White House have been not mum on that, and will the president we have not? It's not that we've been mum. There, there was a, there's, there, we have, we've, there was a statement put out by the State Department um, uh, about this call for settlements. We continue, nothing's changed about our view that settlements continue to be counterproductive to peace and stability and, and the possibility of a two-state solution. We don't support that. Okay, um, and second, you mentioned about the uh, Ukraine and Russia in terms of the civilian casualties. The UN said today that actually half of the facilities of UNRWA has been hit, and 520 people have been killed in addition to the aid workers. So do you still believe that Israel is doing what it takes to protect uh, civilian lives, including women and children? We certainly believe that they need to continue to do more to protect innocent civilian life. Yeah, but we're not doing much. I mean, we've been, I've been asking this question for nine Your months. Your question wasn't about what they're doing or not doing. Your question was, do we believe that they should do more? My answer is yes, well, they need to do more to protect civilian life. And we're going to continue to have conversations with them uh, about how they're prosecuting these, these operations. Thanks, John. Um, just sticking with the Middle East, but connecting up to the other um, big story. At the, uh, during the ABC News interview on Friday, uh, George Stephanopoulos asked the president, was he, quote, the same man today that you were when you took office three and a half years ago? And the president's reply began, in terms of successes, yes, I was also the guy who put together a peace plan for the Middle East that may be coming to fruition. Now, it may or may not be coming to fruition. Uh, we don't know. We do know 38,000 people have been killed in Gaza, almost 2 million displaced, and according to UNICEF, one in three children on the age of two um, is suffering from acute malnutrition. Does the president consider his Gaza policy a success? The president believes uh, wholeheartedly that this ceasefire proposal that we are trying to get done will make a big difference in terms of not only temporarily ce ceasing hostilities, but potentially giving us an opening to end this conflict. Um, it's important to remember how this started, and you talked about our, our Gaza policy, our, I'll, I'll, st I'll state it for you again. We want to make sure Israel has a right to defend itself from the kinds of attacks it suffered on the 7th of October, which I know is easy for people to forget. 1,200 people slaughtered, most at a music festival. Number two, that Israel is doing everything they can to protect innocent civilian life. Is it enough? No. They need to continue to do more. And that we are doing everything we can to give humanitarian assistance into the people of Gaza. That's our Gaza policy. Uh, and as the president has also said, we would be and will still continue to be willing to adjust the policies uh, that, we, uh, that we are executing with respect to Gaza as we see things unfold on the ground. But the broader question was, does he consider his policy to have been successful? Israel is defending itself against a terrorist attack, so we can check that off. Humanitarian assistance continues to flow. In fact, if it wasn't for the United States, uh, I dare say that not on a fraction of the humanitarian assistance that get, is getting into Gaza we get in. Is it enough? No. And the Israelis have taken some steps to be more precise, more discriminate, 
and more careful in their operations. Is it enough? No. So we're going to keep at it. We're going to keep working on this. Is it enough? No. The president described Israel as bombing, indiscriminate bombing in December. Seven months have passed and you have paused one arms shipment, as I understand. Is that fair? That's right. What's your, is there a question here? That's an effective response to indiscriminate bombing of a civilian population. It's never right to be uh, conducting indiscriminate bombing of a civilian population. That's why we continue to work with the Israelis to be more precise, to be more careful. All right, just a couple more. Sorry, sorry. Uh, hi, Admiral. Um, can I um, just start with the Middle East as well? Uh, Hamas has accused Netanyahu of putting obstacles uh, in the way uh, of the ceasefire deal that is being talked about now. Um, does the U.S. think that Netanyahu's government is doing everything it can to secure the ceasefire deal? We're working hard to get that ceasefire deal in place. I'm not going to negotiate here from public, in public or talk about who's saying what and who's doing what. We have seen both sides now, as Andrea rightly asked in her question, we've seen both sides come out with some public statements with respect to the text. The last thing I'm going to do is, is get into bartering here. We're trying to close those gaps as best we can. We wouldn't have sent the CIA director or Brett McGurk to Cairo if we didn't believe it was worth a shot and worth a chance. Um, I would also add that on both sides, you see public comments that aren't necessarily fully reflective of the conversations that we're having with, uh, uh, privately with them or their interlocutors. Well, certainly, just on Ukraine, uh, there's a bit of an information battle over the weekend. The Russians said that they destroyed two Ukrainian Patriot missile systems. The Ukrainians said that they were decoys. Um, does the U.S. have its own independent evaluation of what happens during that strike? And what is the state of Ukraine's air defense system when it comes to Patriot missile systems? Yes, we do. I'm not going to talk about it. And um, I think you're going to hear more here this week about uh, what the Allies and the United States are going to do to continue to bolster Ukrainian air defense. Look, I know we get hung up on the Patriots, and I, I get that. Uh, there has been uh, contributions of Patriot systems uh, by other nations. You talk, uh, we talked about how we're resequencing re some of our, um, uh, our deliveries of Patriot uh, interceptors from some countries now diverting them to Ukraine. We're doing that. Other nations are also trying to contribute Patriots. But let's not get caught up on just one system. There's short range, there's medium range, and there's long range air defense. And Ukraine needs all of it. And again, I think you're going to see this week uh, the Allies really stepping up and showing that they're willing to continue to provide those kinds of capabilities. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Uh, John, Walter Obama is visiting China right now on the heels of a visit to Russia. I'm wondering whether the U.S. has any views on that and what impact it might have on the situation in Ukraine. Yeah, we're concerned about it. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to be productive in terms of trying to get things done in, in Ukraine and trying to move forward to, an, uh, to achieve this just peace that President Zelensky uh, continues to work hard and we continue to try to, to, uh, to operationalize. But yeah, it's, it's concerning. Was there any advance notification given to the U.S. either trip? Russia? No, no, not aware. Can I, can I try one more time on irreversible? Is this the U.S. Yes, you can try. Does the U.S. have a position on the, on the inclusion of that word? Our position is that NATO is going to be in Ukraine's future. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to that point. Um, and the president's looking forward to talking to President Zelensky and our NATO allies about that path, that bridge to NATO. Thank you so much, John. A question on Ukraine and one on Iran. Starting with Ukraine and this Russian rocket attack that killed 30 people at the largest children's hospital. Does this shift the U.S.'s position on not allowing Ukraine to strike directly at Russian airfields that originated these attacks? Shift the position. Yes. Make you change your mind about not allowing that, and how do you justify not giving Ukraine permission to attack? Well, there's been no change in our, our policy. You saw that the president several weeks ago uh, uh, gave guidance to Ukraine that they can use U.S.-supplied weapons to strike targets just over the border. That's still the case. Um, on Iran, um, we've heard the U.S. say that this election, this presidential election, was not free and fair, that they have doubts if this is going to change anything meaningfully. But we've also heard the U.S. say that they will even, um, negotiate or do diplomacy with Iran when it serves our national interests. So is the U.S. now ready to resume nuclear talks, other talks, or make any diplomatic moves with Iran in light of this new president? No. Okay, Ariana, I'm sorry. So, no, can, you, can you elaborate, no. please? Well, it seemed like a pretty easy 
question to answer. Then no, we're, we're, we're not in a position where we're willing to get back to the negotiating table with Iran just based on the fact that they've elected a new president. They're still supporting terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. They're still supporting the Houthis as the Houthis attack ships in the Red Sea. Uh, they're still attacking shipping uh, as well. And they're still supplying drones and drone technology and drone expertise to the Russians so that the Russians can continue to kill innocent Ukrainians like they did over the weekend. So no, no. This guy seems a bit more moderate. Do you see any opening? We'll, look, we'll, we'll see what this guy wants to get done, but we are not expecting any changes in Iranian behavior, sadly. We got Ariel, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, this morning, the president said that uh, France rejected extremism during the latest parliamentary election and expressed his confidence that the United States would also do so. So France has a very different electoral system, as you know. So why this optimism from the president? And more mm -hmm. broadly, was there a sense of relief in the administration that the election turned out the way it did? I think it's pretty clear from the election that the, the far right didn't find the purchase that it wanted to find and that, uh, um, that uh, compromise uh, in a democracy is going to have to still be uh, the watchword in France as it is here in the United States. And it's not going to change our strong relationship with France. It's not going to change the fact that France is a valued NATO ally. And the president's looking forward to continuing to work with President Macron and the entire team. All right, last question. Go ahead. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Admiral. I was just wondering, with the renewed spotlight and scrutiny on President Biden in public settings this week, how he's preparing for the NATO summit, how you yeah. guys are deciding how many questions to take at the press conference. <laughs> what, what you got to ask, you ask the press secretary that one. Who's prepping him for a lot of this on Ooh. matters of national security well, so, and foreign so, policy? So, so am I. <laughs> Um, it's yeah, it's exactly. It's a team effort. Um, uh, yeah, I, I will let Corrine talk about the, the press conference, the big boy press conference that <laughs> y'all are planning to have. Um, but he has already had discussions with his national security team in the lead up to the summit, as you might expect that he would. He's reviewing material. He's he's doing his homework and getting ready. Um, he's got uh, the first uh, major set of remarks uh, tomorrow night at the Mellon Auditorium. He's working his way through those remarks, as you would expect him to do. Um, and he's getting ready for the uh, at least the two bilateral meetings that we know he's going to have specifically with the new prime minister of the UK and with President Zelensky later in the week. So what I have seen from my perch is the normal amount of preparatory work that he does before a major international conference. No different than how he prepared for the G7 or for the events in Normandy or, or previous international fora. So it's pretty typical from what I've seen. And do you expect Vice President Harris to play a role in the events this week or to take any meetings during the time that she'll be watching? I can't speak for the Vice President's uh, staff and team, but I can have them get back to you about what her schedule is going to look like. Thank you so much, Admiral. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, okay. Well, all the debate questions have been answered. <laughs> Press conference answered. Let me, close, let me close my book and get out of here. Uh, hi, Zeke. Thanks, Green. Uh, my first to you is on the credibility of this White House when it comes to talking about the President's health. Uh, yeah. When you were here uh, last Tuesday, you were asked if the President had had any medical examinations um, since yeah. his physical in February or that included the time period after the debate. Yep. Um, you said flatly no. Yep. Uh, three days later, you admitted that the President had a quote, short check in with the yeah. medical team thereafter. I mean, those are, those are two very no, no, different no, no, answers. No, 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 no. Actually, actually if, you, if you were to listen to the, I think I did a 30 minute gaggle on Friday, 30 minutes with, uh, I think it was an, uh, with, uh, with the pool. And, uh, and I said he did not have a medical, I, I cleared it up. You're right, you're correct. I said he didn't, I still stand, but he didn't have a medical exam. I said that in the gaggle, and you're right, I said that in the briefing. He had a check in. Uh, with uh, and he had, he said this on on Friday uh, he had a check in with his um, uh, with his uh, medical doctor which is something that he does a couple times a week as you know and I, I say I stated this as well he has for for those who don't know uh, obviously outside of the briefing room outside of the White House many Americans don't actually understand this so let's take a step back they they deal with their medical uh, issues or f uh, physicals very very differently. They are very, you know, they are lucky if they get to see their their doctor once or twice a year, right? They have to get in a car. They have to either uh, take public transportation in order to make that happen. The president's medical unit is literally down on the other side of the colonnade. Uh, it's just down the steps from the residence, and so 
a couple times a week, he does a check-in, a verbal check-in with his doctor while he's exercising. That is something that happens uh, often. Uh, matter of fact, he did a check-in today uh, because I know folks were going to ask about if he was tested for COVID. Uh, he was not. Uh, we are following CDC guidance. He was not tested uh, for COVID, uh, just to let you guys know about that one. And if he has any symptoms, obviously, uh, we would test him. Is that but, in the context of, of the second gentleman's diagnosis? Yes, or? yes, which is why. No, no, no. It's, it's in context of the second gentleman. But to answer your point, he did not have a medical exam. He did not have a physical. He did do like a verbal check-in with his doctor uh, a couple days after the debate. Uh, and it was very quick. It was a couple of words that were spoken to each other. And that's how uh, we were able to, to, to uh, were able to give you that answer. But he did not have a medical exam. He so did so not when, have when a physical. You said no, though, last Tuesday. Yeah. Was, uh, uh, did you know about that verbal check-in? Or no. did we just not ask him not no. precise enough so, questions? So the line of questions that I was getting uh, that day was in the way that I was hearing the question was about the medical exam. I answered MJ's question when she asked me medical exam uh, and I answered and say, I said no physical and then somebody else asked me was there a check in. I did not mean to steer anybody wrong. I was still thinking about the medical exam. I was still thinking about the physical. That's how I answered the question. And then when it became, uh, uh, when the president actually spoke to it, we actually, I went back, asked the, asked the, uh, asked the, uh, the medical doctor, and he said they had a verbal check-in. That's what he said. But in answering the question, I was talking about the medical exam. I was talking about the physical. And then shoot a quick one. So, um, there's been a lot of reporting the last 24 sure. hours about a, a Parkinson's expert who's come to visit the White House. Uh, uh, almost a dozen times over the last year or so, including at least one meeting with the president's uh, physician. Um, could you state like, very clearly, yes or no, was that uh, expert here to participate in anything surrounding the care of the president of the United States? So let me just say a couple of things. We have had uh, a comprehensive, uh, and, and I just want to take another step back, comprehensive uh, physical examination. The president has had that. We've given a comprehensive report. We've shared that the past three years. Every year that he has, uh, every year that he has had this, uh, this exam, he sees a neurologist. Uh, and uh, just to give you a quote from that, uh, from the report most recently in February, an extremely detailed neurological exam was again reassuring in that there were no findings which would be consistent with any uh, cerebella, a cerebellar or other central neurological disorder, such as a stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, or ascending lateral sclerosis, and quote. Uh, so that came directly from in February uh, in that comprehensive uh, report that was provided by the president's doctor uh, to me that I shared with all of you. So anyone who is watching can certainly uh, go to That's our website. The question, which was this, was this expert's visits, to, or is multiple visits to the White House so, pertaining at all to the president's well, care? Here's the thing. I have I've said he's he has had three, he has th had three uh, three physicals. In those three physicals, that's when he has seen a specialist, a, neuro a well, neurological a specialist. specialist. So I have to be super mindful here, and this is why. And I'll and I'll explain this to you in a second. There are thousands of military personnel who come onto this White House. Uh, many of them get the care from the White House medical unit, uh, and so need to be super careful. There are, uh, you know, the medical unit uh, hosts a wide range of specialists, from dermatologists to neurologists, and so I cannot speak to every person person because there are actually there's actually a security reasons to protect their privacy we respect and protecting uh, people's privacy so do not want to share uh, I'm not going to share people's names from here uh, but the president I can tell you has seen a neurologist three times as it's connected to the uh, to a physical that he gets every year that we provide to all of you very basic direct question wait 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 hold on hold on wait 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 a second eight times or at least once in regards to I the just, president wait, specifically. Hold on a Not second. Not you should be able to answer by this point. Wait, no, 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 no. No, wait a minute. Come, Ed, please. A little respect here, please. So every year around the, the president's physical examination, he sees a neurologist. That's three times, right? So I am telling you that he has seen a neurologist three times while he has been in this presidency. That's what I'm saying. I am telling you that he has seen them three times. That is what I'm sharing with you, right? So every time he has a physical, he has had to see a neurologist. So 
That is answering that question. No, it's not. No, it is. It yes. is. You're Dr. asking Kevin me. Kennard, I the cannot, White House but I just, and I also said to you, condition. Ed, I also said to you, for security reasons, we cannot share names. We cannot share names. You can we have to. We have to. Others he would have met with. We but cannot, you can share names no, 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 in regards no, no, no. to if we, someone came here no, in regards we to the cannot share. We cannot share names of specialists broadly, it, from a dermatologist to a neurologist. We cannot share names. There are security reasons. No, we no, have to. We no, have no, to protect. I understand I that. I, un I, I hear it's you. It's right I, there for anyone to see. Ed, I hear you. I cannot from here confirm any of that because we have to keep their privacy. I think they would appreciate that too. We have oh, to give them. The the doctor. We have to keep their privacy. It's public. It is public. It's public I, I, I it hear you. I am. Guys, 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 guys hold question. on a second. There's no reason to get back and go back and forth and well, be in this aggressive way. We missed around here about how information's been shared with the press corps about him. What do you missed about? Oh, what do you missed everything about? Everything he just asked about. It, what do you? And then every time I come back and I answer the question and that you, you guys asked. Correctly, you didn't have to come back and clean. I up never answered answer the question incorrectly. That is not true. I was asked about a medical exam. I was asked about a physical. That was in the line of question that I answered, and I said no. He did not have a medical exam, and I still stand that by that. Matter of fact, the president still stands by that. He had a verbal check-in. That is something that the president has a couple times a week, a couple times a week. Now, in regards to Dr. Kevin Kennard. And I am telling you right now that I am not sharing confirming names from here. It is a security reasons. I am not going to do that, Ed. It doesn't matter how hard you push me. It doesn't matter how angry you get with me. I'm not going to confirm a name. It doesn't matter if it's even in the log. I am not going to do that from here. That is not something I am going to do. What I can share with you is that the president has seen a neurologist for his physical three times, three times. And it is in the reporting that we share a comprehensive reporting. Matter of, matter of fact, it's more than what the last guy shared. And it is in line with what George, George W. Bush did. It's in line with what Obama did. And so it is comprehensive. It is out there. I just read a quote from it. But I am not, I am not going to devolve somebody's name and, or confirm someone. I'm not going to do that. That is as is privacy for that person. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't matter how hard you push me. It doesn't matter how angry you get with me from here. I'm just not going to do that. It is inappropriate and it's not acceptable. So I'm not going to do it. No, not the name. Go ahead. Right. No, okay. Confirm the name. Can yeah. you confirm whether or not the president has seen this Parkinson's specialist? Um, and you mentioned yeah. three times, but the visitor logs show a duration of eight visits over eight months. I think that is the crux of the question. But I, but I also said, I also said there are thousands of military personnel that come to the White House, and they are under the care of the medical unit. They are. So can you confirm that the Parkinson's I, visit, specialist visits were for the president? I, or not? What I can tell you is that the president has seen a neurologist three times, and I read to you what the neurologist has said, and I read to you the last, the last line. I could say it again. Uh, no findings which would be consistent with any cerebellar or other central neurologi neurological disorders, such as stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's or ascending lateral sclerosis. That is from that is from February. That is coming from February. That is what the medical unit, the the president's doctor, shared. And I share. I said to you, it's happened three times. Each time there is a physical that occurs, and we put out a comprehensive report. That is when he has been able uh, to see uh, to see a specialist. So that's what I can share. Question on on this. Um, has the president, you mentioned Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, all of these things. Um, one diagnosis that we have heard of potential diagnosis is hydrocephalus, which is fluid buildup in the brain. It's something we've never heard in any of the medical reports. Is that something that the president has if it's, been about? If it's, if it's not in the medical report, obviously, it's not, it, it's not something that the president uh, is dealing with. Uh, if, it has been it, oh, well, I can tell you this. Just going back to Parkinson's for a little bit, so to give you some answers here, has the president been treated for Parkinson's? No. Is he being treated for Parkinson's? No, he's not. Is he taking medication 
for Parkinson's? No. So those are the things that I can give you full blown answers on, but I'm not going to do, I'm not going to confirm a specialist, a, any specialist that comes to, come, comes well, to the White House out of privacy. The question is, uh, will the president go to the Hill today? I know we saw his letter. Um, uh, is he intending to have this conversation face to face with him? So look, the president, uh, obviously this is uh, uh, someone who is a senator for 36 years, who was the president of the Senate as when he was vice president for eight years. Uh, and he respects, truly respects the members of Congress and has always and will always do that, especially as a former senator. And I will say, and you heard, you've heard us say this before or most recently, is this is a president who's won, uh, won the primary, right? By 14 million votes, 87% of those votes, uh, so certainly. Uh, and look, I don't have any engagements to read out, you know, outside of that. But I will say that the president was in Pennsylvania. I just mentioned at the top, he got, he got to see Senator Fetterman, Senator Casey. Uh, he also uh, got to see Cong Congresswoman Dean. He spent some time with them. They traveled across uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I will say when the president gets knocked down, he gets back up. This is quintessential Joe Biden. And there are a long list of other uh, congressional members who have shown their support uh, for this president. I don't have anything else to read out. You saw the letter. The, pre letter, was, the letter was, I think, pretty pretty clear on where the president stands, uh, and I'll just leave it there. Okay. Yeah. You've noted that there are thousands within the Walter Reed system who may be treated by a specialist who visits yeah. uh, here at the White House, but this neurologist had a meeting with the president's physician, with his doctor. You're refusing that. to say if he was here to evaluate the president or if he was consulting on the president's health, so what then was that meeting about? And I will say that Dr. O'Connor leads the medical unit. He's so literally, he he's literally, the, he leads the medical unit. No, oh, because we will not confirm or or uh, speak to names that are you're providing to me. It is out of security reason, is out of protecting someone's privacy. We're just not going to do that. But they are. The reason that I mention that is because there are a thousand military members that do indeed use the use the White House medical unit. They do. They get care from that. We're talking about the president of the United States. Guys, I'm trying to answer the question so you can connect the dot that there are multiple neurologists that come, not neurologists, specialists that come through here uh, because there are a thou like more than a thousand medical, uh, medical military personnel here, uh, military personnel here. But you certainly could clear this all up just by saying what he was doing here and if it was connected to the president, yes or no? I, I am not going to confirm the, the a, a particular neurologist, anybody. It doesn't matter if they're a dermatologist or a neurologist. I'm just not going to do that. I shared with all of you that the president has met, has been with the neurologist three times as it relates to his physical, three times. So you know, know I'm just not, I'm, guys, I'm just not gonna do that out of security reasons, out of privacy. It is, it is not something that I'm going to do. A measure of privacy, we have to be able to give people from here. One other question. Uh, 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 the president, the president's doctor, you say, has seen no reason to evaluate him for Parkinson's since his physical in February. Is that based on these verbal check-ins that you've been describing based on his public appearances? Will you say that one more time? You've said that the, the president's doctor has seen no reason to evaluate him or reevaluate him for Parkinson's since that physical in February. What is that based on? Is it these well, verbal check-ins? I, I never said that. 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 Well, what I have said is what, what I have said uh, is that he just had a physical just in February, uh, and the physical was very clear. Uh, it was a comprehensive physical. Uh, it, we gave out a report on that, uh, and uh, and you know as it relates to the check-ins, that is something that is common. The the president has a medical unit that is literally down the hall uh, that he's able to check in with when necessary. They normally do it while he's exercising. That is not uncommon. It is very different. It is very different uh, than any everyday American. They do not have that option. They do not have that access because he's president of the United States. Every other president has had that access and they are able to do that. So just to be clear, yes yeah. or no, has he has his physician seen a reason to reevaluate him for Parkinson's since the February physical? No. The, the, the comprehensive report that you all have stands. There is, we, the president obviously will have another physical and we'll wait for that physical. Great. Sorry, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the president has said twice that he's had neurological evaluations as part of his physicals, you know, in, in these various yeah. interviews today and, then, and also on ABC. But there have been a number of people who have said, listen, you know, 
why don't you have a cognitive test just to rule out that there are any issues? Would the president, you know, do you, you know, would you, would you counsel him you. to do that just to sort of put an end to no, these questions? Andre, I hear you. The neurologists have said it is not warranted. The president himself, he said it today, he said it multiple times, and the doctor has said this. Everything that he does day in and day out as it relates to delivering for the American people is a cognitive test. Uh, and that is what the medical doctor has said. Uh, that is what the specialist has said. I do want to, I, I just want to take a step back for a second because I do take offense to what uh, Ed alluded to. You know, come out here, every day there's a press briefing and we do our best to give you the information that we have at the time. That's what we do. And we understand that the freedom of the press, we respect the freedom of the press. You heard me talk about this last week. We, I appreciate the back and forth that we all have. It is, I try to respect you, and I hope you try to respect me. And we literally do everything that we can. My team does everything that we can to make sure we get the answers to you. That's what we do. And sometimes we disagree. Sometimes we are not in agreement. But you know what? That's democracy. That is what is important, to have that healthy back and forth. And so to say that I'm holding information or allude to anything else is not unfair. It's really, really unfair. I think people who are watching and have been watching this briefing for this past week could say that we are doing our best in this briefing to provide the information that we have. And I will admit, I will be the first one to admit, sometimes I get it wrong. At least I admit that. At least I admit that. And sometimes I don't have the information. And I will always, always admit that. But I do take offense to what was just happening at the beginning of this briefing. It's not OK. Go ahead. We are seeking clarity. I understand that. And uh, I think what we're trying to say is when a name is in a public record on a waves form, yeah. that it is in the public domain. Yeah. The president could authorize that his medical records or additional medical information uh, could be made public because uh, he could waive HIPAA, he could do those things. Yeah. Um, and if he chooses to do that, we would like to know more. Part of the reason we are pressing here is that we are not clear on what has happened, and yeah. therefore the American people who, to whom we report don't have a sense of it. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and so but the personal attacks is not okay. And, and so we want to have a positive. Want to be very very clear here. <laughs> so the question is one question is after um, a debate that drew days and days and days of scrutiny, why hasn't the president had an in-person physical check-in? Maybe blood work, maybe other things. Yeah. Because when he said he was seen, I certainly thought he had been physically seen, no. not a phone check. No. So as, and that's part of what we're saying about yeah. how information comes out in waves, and then totally we may have a different impression. So and I totally this understand dominated that. his presidency yeah. for 10 days. And he could submit to another exam, a full exam, partial exam, whatever. He can waive his right to make things public. None of us are asking about the military members who might be seeing a physician mm -hmm. here. None of us. We are only asking about yeah. the president's well-being. Understood. And so that's why we want to understand. When you see yeah. on the public records that a physician with his specialty has come to the White House, gone to the residence clinic, and met with the president's physician, we feel like there is more to be said there, and that's what we're asking. I, and I understand that, Kelly O, and you know I respect you wholeheartedly, and I've known you for some time. We want to be also, because we are particular, we are talking about someone whose name who is out there, and I understand. I get it. It's in the law. I get that. It's in the law. What's the security concern? We want to, we want to respect that person and give them the measure of privacy that they deserve. The moment I say anything about any specialist, it becomes a thing from this podium. So what I can share, and this is what I can share, he has seen a neurologist three times. Three times, not more, not, not more than that. Not more than that. He's seen a neurologist three times. Uh, and that is connected to the physical, the comprehensive physical that we have been able to share with you. So I think that gives you some information about how many times, three times. Uh, and the reason why I am sharing that there are thousands of military personnel, so you also have an understanding because there are thir a thousand military p personnel that comes here, and that not just comes here, but under the care of the medical unit, right? 
they get they get care from the White House Medical Unit. They there tends to be dermatologists from dermatologists to neurolog neurologists who come through here, who come through here because the White House Medical Unit is in, indeed caring for folks. So I have confirmed three times, three times. I just cannot get into details or confirm a name of a person. I cannot do that. There's security reasons. We have to give people a measure of he privacy. Would waive some of his records and make those. I don't know how all of that works. I'm not going to pretend. I I know how that that works. Uh, and what I will do is certainly will share that information with the with the powers that be. I just don't want to get into a back and forth on that particular question. Yeah. Thanks, Karine. I mean, to Kelly's point, the yeah. president today, when he called into Morning Joe, he said that he had released all of his medical records. Um, should we take that as an indication that he's going to do so? Well, look, what I can say is that we have shared uh, a comprehensive medical report uh, that is pretty detailed, that is in line with other presidents, certainly not the last one, but the ones, uh, the two before, uh, before the last president. Uh, and we have been pretty much in line with what they have been what they have done what uh, to be more clear George W Bush and uh, and uh, also uh, President Obama so we've the been one did let his doctors come to the briefing room to speak to us okay and we know what that last president said from this briefing room okay so uh, <laughs> and only did three I think three or four paragraphs very different very different approach. During the call today to MSNBC, yeah, sure. was the president reading off of a script? So I was in the room when the president uh, called into Morning Joe. The president spoke from his heart. The president was very clear there was no script at all. Uh, and he was uh, very detailed. You heard him say actually during the call that he was reading some quotes. He said it. He shared that information. He was reading some quotes from, uh, from the debate. Uh, so he shared that with you. What you heard was a passionate uh, interview it was about 18 minutes. Uh, he talked about and laid out his vision for this country. Uh, he talked about uh, how he wants to make sure we move forward. I want to be really careful because he also talked about the campaign, which I can't do from here. Uh, but uh, he, he, uh, you know, I think it was incredibly powerful. He was reading quotes, but not from a script. No, nope, it was not a script. In a big voice press conference, how many questions script. should we expect that he is going to take? So look, it is going to be a uh, solo press conference. It is going to be certainly more than a two plus two. Uh, I'm not going to, we're still working it out, so I'm not going to go into specifics from here. Uh, but you would, could expect uh, a solo press conference from this president at the end of, uh, of uh, the NATO summit. Uh, he's looking forward to it, and he will be taking your questions. So that'll be a great, good thing. Great, great. Uh, uh, great. Uh, something different. Great. Great. Um, I have two questions. Yes. One, a follow up on Dr. Kennard, and that is yeah. can you explain what the role of Megan Nasworthy is? Does she oversee care for some of those military personnel that you were referencing as a group, or does she oversee care for the president? Uh, I believe, I, again, want to be careful here. Uh, uh, I know who you're speaking of. I don't have her full portfolio in front of me, so I would have my team and I will be happy to get back to you. Okay. And then on the President's and the White House's engagement with House Democrats, yeah. um, and Democrats more broadly, there was an article a month ago in the Wall Street Journal that the White House universally panned because the on-the-record quotes uh, criticizing the President's age and acuity were largely from Republicans. But I want to ask yeah. about the graphs in that story about Democrats. It said that the from White that House, same story. From that same story. Okay. It said that the White House kept close tabs on the journal's interviews with Democratic lawmakers, and after the offices of several Democrats shared with the White House either a recording of an interview or details about what was asked, some of those lawmakers spoke to the journal a second time and once again emphasized Biden's strength. They quote Congressman Gregory Meeks, a New York Democrat, saying, they just, you know, said that I should give you a call back. I'm wondering if you could characterize what the White House told Democrats to tell reporters about I think the Dem Democrats spoke for themselves. Uh, I think, you know, you know how stories work. Uh, it, 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 there is a, there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, when you all come with a story from us and we want to make sure you hear from other voices, we, we make that available to you all. Uh, and it is up to, to the reporters if they're going to reach out or not to that particular person. But we expect and we anticipate and we understand that uh, it doesn't matter uh, who, if it's a congressperson or a governor uh, or any elected official, 
they're going to speak for themselves. They're going to speak for themselves. And I would say that uh, Representative Greg Meeks has also been very supportive. If you fast forward to where we are today, uh, Representative Meeks has very, been very supportive of this president, uh, continuing, moving forward. Uh, and we've heard from many others, many others. The CBC more, more broadly has been uh, uh, very supportive. We heard from the chair, uh, Chairman Hosford, Hosford uh, from uh, the CBC. And so that is the type of support that we continue to see. So there hasn't been outreach by the White House to Democrats who might have misgivings about the president's age or acuity to have them say positive things about the president publicly? I, 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 I'm not really, I don't quite understand where you're going with the question. I, I think I explained it sometimes when you all are working on stories uh, and we want to hear, you want to, we, and we were trying to provide supporters from the president, that is not unusual. And it is up to the reporter to reach out or not. Uh, and so that is something that we certainly do. Uh, that is something that, you know, that is not uncommon. Uh, and, uh, but what I would say more broadly, there are. Uh, there are congressional members, as we're talking about what's happening in Congress, as we're talking about uh, the president's outreach, as we're talking about, uh, you know, how we move forward. There are congressional members out there who have been incredibly supportive. So we have to remember there are hundreds of House members, uh, and, uh, and so, Can you know, you there are folks out there. the president's outreach today and tomorrow? Yeah, so yeah. All conference and all caucus meetings. So what I can say uh, is that, as you all know, the president uh, the president has done some outreach. He's to spoke about it himself. I can say, as of today, he has uh, uh, he has engaged with dozens of members, whether in person or on calls. We saw him engaging with congressional members over the weekend. Uh, we saw him doing that on several of the trips that he has done over the past ten days. It's been about six uh, states that he's been able to to stop over and and do and engage with uh, supporters. So he's been able to do that and there's a long list uh, I'm trying to spare you the list here but there is a long list Senator Chris Kuhn Senator John Fetterman Senator Alex Padilla Senator Chuck Schumer Senator B Bernie Sanders uh, Senator Ra Raphael Warnock it goes on and on Representative Clyburn Al Green uh, Horsford as I mentioned already there has been a long list of we believe incredibly uh, supportive supportive congressional uh, congressional members uh, who have continued that have been provided yeah. to us from the campaign too, but I'm wondering yeah. if the president has spoken directly with um, Leader Schumer and yeah. Minority yeah. Leader share, Jeffries in the last that. 24 hours. And whether yeah. the president, the president has we, I hear you. We shared that just last week that the president spoke uh, to the leadership, uh, I, obviously on the Democratic has side. Spoken to them since yesterday. I don't have anything to read out to you uh, uh, as far as what we've uh, shared with you last week, but the president has been in regular touch. Uh, and uh, those conversations went very, very well. I think he mentioned, uh, in particular, Leader uh, Jeffries, that went almost for an hour. The president said that himself. Uh, he said how much they had a, a very, uh, very good conversation. Uh, the president saw Congresswoman Dean, as I mentioned. He saw uh, both senators of, of Pennsylvania as well yesterday, traveled across uh, the state, uh, and, uh, and had really uh, Two, two uh, big events uh, with supporters, with Americans who got, got to hear directly from the president. And I think that's important. Great. Again, Michael. Uh, yeah, thanks, Karine. Uh, were all three of President Biden's neuro neurological exams that you've confirmed, were they all conducted at Walter Reed? Look, I don't have a, I don't have anything to, to state as to location. What I can say for sure that he has seen a neurologist three times as it relates to uh, the, uh, the exam that he takes every year. Uh, and I just don't have a location to speak to. Well, let me just try a, sure. a different way. I mean, has any neurologist? And you not, know, and you also know that the president does go to Walter Reed yes, to, do, like to, do, right, to, to do, right, to do, uh, to do these, uh, to do this, his physical exams. Well, has a neurologist? I'm not talking about yeah. uh, anyone in particular, regardless of the identity name of that person. Has any neurologist came to the White House to visit President Biden? What I can tell you during those exams. That he that we have been able to do every year for the past three years, and there is a comprehensive exam uh, that uh, we share. A comprehensive is a report that we share with all of you. He has seen a neurologist. And that's why I'm trying to clarify. It seems like those were taken at Walter Reed, and that's I, and so it's an important distinction. In all this. You you all know that he does indeed go to Walter Reed as part of his physical exam. That is no secret. That is something that he does, uh, and. I also confirm that he sees a neurologist every time that he's done this, these exams. I don't have anything beyond okay. that. Thanks. Green. 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 Green.
Corrine, um, as you're talking, as everyone's talking about yeah. neurological issues, um, this is different but kind of on that same page. The president has had two aneurysms, okay? And there are complications from aneurysms to include impaired short-term memory, um, inability to concentrate, as well as speech difficulties. Have any neurologists worked with him or just trying to observe him as he is a person who has suffered from two aneurysms that could have been fatal? I, look, April, in the, uh, in the comprehensive reporting that we share with all of you on a yearly basis, the neurological exam have been detailed, extremely detailed. It is directly from the doctor. They talk about the specifics of that neurological exam. Uh, and so I would refer you to the six-page comprehensive uh, memo, and that's what I refer you to. But that is something that we know about, that he had two aneurysms. Yeah. And, and that is part, all of those complications are part of a neurological exam. Have they tested for that at all? Do you know? What I can tell you is that the, f the exams have been detailed, they have been extensive, and that's what I can share with you. I would refer you to the to the uh, to the to the document and to the last report. Question: sure. We're just days away from the Republican convention. How do you, as this White House who stands behind uh, this president, how do you work to do an image change or an image change to revamp him to make him shinier and brighter, if you will? So I'm not going to speak to the Republican convention. That's something that I'm not going to do, but I am okay, going to wait, hold on, wait, hold on a second. Hold on. Give me a second. Uh, look, in the past 10 days, the president has gone to six states. He has. He's gone to North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Georgia, Pennsylvania. I know that's a commonwealth, but he's been to six. And in that time, he has engaged directly, directly with uh, the American public. And you've seen the enthusiasm, you've seen the energy. Uh, he's been able to talk to them directly and talk about his goals for the future. Talk about what he's done in the past three and a half years. They have, and they have heard uh, specifically uh, from him on even his health, even the debate. And I think that's important too. So, and, and you just heard me lay out the next two weeks. So the president's going to continue to go out there. He's going to continue to be present in the communities. Uh, he's going to continue to hear directly from the American people. And that's the best way to do this. That's the best way to get out there. That's the best way to make sure that you have your finger on the pulse and that the American gets to, people get to see you for themselves. Since you all speak to the Republican convention, what about the Democratic convention? I can't speak to the Democratic all? convention either. I can't speak to that. That's for the... the I, I, no, but you're, you're, you're asking me to, to, to speak to two things that I can't speak to from here. That is something that the campaign and the convention can speak to very, very... Right at the end of the <laughs> April, you may not like my answer, but I'm telling you the president's going to continue to go out there. We just, I just shared with you at the top a robust plan that the president has to be out there, whether it is in Vegas, whether it's in Texas, and let's not forget the other states that he's visited in the last 10 days, in the last 10 days. There's a stark difference from what we've been doing and what the other side is doing, stark difference. And so the president is committed. He's going to continue to do that. He wants to engage, engage directly with the American people. 600 people at the church yesterday, 600 people at the event in Harrisburg, that's a pretty good start. And that's just a continuation. That's actually not a start. That's a continuation. Go ahead, yeah. Josh. I know. Is I'm it, getting is it still the administration's policy that physicals are done annually? Yes, that is, that is just like every other president has done before this president. We're going to continue to, up, to uphold that. So it would be fair to us to assume that as of now, his next expected physical would be next year? It would be next year. The last one was in February. Okay. And can you uh, clarify for us, uh, forgive me, I might have missed it, or yeah. by design, uh, he will or he won't go to the hotel tomorrow? Say that one he more time. Oh, I don't have any engagement to share. As you know, NATO is front of mind. That's what he's focused on. You saw that letter uh, that came out from the president. He's going to be focusing on the more than 30 world leaders that are coming that are coming here for the 75th anniversary of NATO. Continuing to show our, the strength of our alliance. I think it is. Uh, I think it is something that the president is very much looking forward to. And you'll certainly hear from the president on Thursday when he gives his press conference, his big boy press conference, as your colleague Justin has has stated many times. 
people here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we shouldn't expect then some sort of big outreach push to member of Democratic. I, I mean, members. look, I th we have shared. I just shared that he has done dozens of calls. Uh, out, not just calls, but also face-to-face, -face, as he did in Pennsylvania. Uh, his his team, uh, campaign side, they're going to do their thing. We're going to do our thing on our side. Uh, and he, you know, respects uh, tremendously uh, Congress. And so we're, he's in regular contact with them, and that's what you're going to continue to see. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.